and I looked, and behold, the heavens were open. A ninth season. <laughs> we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the five solas. We believe in the doctrines of grace. A lot of the time, people are asking the wrong questions. They're not asking the questions like, do I understand God's grace? Do I understand the cross? Every single one of us has our own ministry. It doesn't matter if you work as a CEO or you work at McDonald's or whatever you do, or whether you're quote unquote in ministry, you have a ministry. As we mature, we walk, we, we enjoy our relationship with God in as much as we see his majesty in the blessings that we have just by what Yeshua has done for us, not by what we have done to impress God and then get something from him. So, faith, but, so, so salvation by faith. Absolutely. Salvation by faith. I keep zeroing in on these, you know, the big ideas. Like, what is biblical love? You know, what is what is grace? Do I have an accurate understanding of God's grace? Our love for Yeshua, but His love, like, through us, is why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why it's called Messiah Matters. Okay. You know, I don't know. How, is it? Don't is, call the comment any, line. They won't answer. Nice. <laughs> did did uh, did we say anything worth repeating? <laughs> mm, probably not. Probably not. It's well, subjective. It's what subjective. do you think? We'll we'll ask the chat room. They're in control. Should we? Uh, we got twenty people now. Should we go back and and should we? Uh, uh, <laughs> we can hear you now. <laughs> Hey, this is how we should make money. We just don't let, we just don't turn the audio on in the beginning and all of a sudden people super chat us. That's funny. Let's let's That's ask the funny. chat room should we should we just clip it and uh re-upload it later or should we uh should we just start? Or sh- should we start we, over? We just let's just kick into our kick into it. Our we'll thing. Are you going to upload the, the later? I can upload it. Question. This is before I forget. I, I know we're getting to the end of the ninth season, which means we're coming into our 10th season here. And I'm thinking new music. Yes. And some sort of new, like what's the new image or what's the new theme in terms of graphics going to be. Hmm. Yeah. That's up to our graphic artist. I love saying that. Like, like we have a huge budget and we have a graphic artist. <laughs> we're going to have to talk to the design team. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, so let's, let's stop for a few, pause for a few seconds. Let's, uh, go back now and tell people what we were talking about because I was somewhat interested. Uh, first of all, you wouldn't have been able to get a hold of us, uh, on the comment line, two, five, three, four, six, five, 3205, because it's just an answering machine and we don't answer it. You could have emailed me, but I probably still wouldn't answer that. See Hagatorresource.com. If you're watching this clipped or if you're listening to this clipped on the uh, podcast, what we're talking about is we went an entire, I don't know how long without realizing that our audio Half is on. Five, no, no. five minutes, five minutes without realizing that our audio is on. This show is brought to you by Torah Resource uh, and you can go read, listen. The audio is on over there. Uh, go to Torah Resource, find all sorts of wonderful resources. We were talking about the ETS and SBL. That's what we were, we were talking about. 
And uh, basically what's going on is my uh, Augustinian, the, the teacher that I had for Augustine, my Augustinian uh, studies teacher, uh, is one of the keynote speakers at the ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society. And uh, then uh, my Hebrew teacher, Dr. Wayne, uh, Dwayne Garrett, is... Um, is also presenting. We were laughing because I don't know actually what he's presenting on. I'm sure something that has to do with Hebrew, right? And uh, then also uh, we were talking about the fact that, uh, yeah, Rob's going to present it at the Society of Biblical Literature. We live leave in two and a half weeks. Uh, we're super excited, super excited. It's in Denver, Colorado. If you're in the Denver area and you want to go see some awesome papers, uh, you should sign up to go see the ETS. I, I've got three presentations, actually, now that I think about it, <laughs> because we're doing a special tour resource night for Erev Shabbat the night or the 18th in Colorado Springs. I need to talk to your dad about that to make sure we're. Uh, I think he's going to I think word? he's going to switch. I think he's going to switch topics, by the way. That's fine. Yeah. He, you know. It's oral <laughs> tradition. You know, you can. So, it, no, no. Some people in the chat, Jessica in the chat room says that uh, instead of starting over again, what we should do is we should voice over something funny over the beginning <laughs> of it. That's not a bad idea. I like it. It's not a bad idea. Um, okay. Well, sorry. We're kind of all over the place, obviously. This is what you get for not listening to professionals, but listening to us instead. <clears throat> I'm going to try to pull I up do, my... Uh, I do. I would I like to put something out there. Please. I... I got onto Google Maps and yeah. I went down to coffee, you know, best coffee downtown Denver. Yeah. And it and there's a couple hits. Yeah. So if anybody has uh, any favorite coffee in downtown Denver, that's like walking distance from the convention center. Let us know. If let you live know. in, De if you live in Denver, Colorado, and, and you're you would like to, to buy Caleb and me a coffee. <laughs> if you live in Denver, Colorado, and you uh, and you uh, and you train at a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym close to the downtown Sheraton, and you want to come pick me up and choke me, <laughs> give me a call. Definitely and, and email I'll me. I'll come to. I'll video the whole thing. <laughs> they probably wouldn't um, let me. In. Uh, sorry, no, sir. You okay? Can't so, to. so let's do this real quick. We we have we owe so some coffee people and some jujitsu. That's coffee all we need. and jujitsu. <laughs> Jesus and jujitsu. That's what I keep saying. I go places JJJ. and I realize I realize that people need uh, people need two things in their two life. Things. <laughs> Jesus and jujitsu. That's what they need in their life. Okay, um, let's that's do a lot some. Of J. It is a lot of J. And, J, and there's J, no J. room for Java in there. I think that's four J. Jesus, uh, Jiu-Jitsu, and Java. In Java, okay. I, I'm Let's good see with the, I, the Jesus now, and Java. Uh, because of our all of the people who gave us super chats, we're going to get, do a couple of uh, a couple of sound clips here. And what we're going to do, we're going to do, do two different ones because we have uh, Love is Bigger. First of all, she gave us two super chats telling us to turn our audio on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sponsored by Ace Religious <laughs> Supply, where they say, if we don't got it, it ain't holy. Weights and measures. You've been blessed. I know. Better? Is that better? Okay. And now let's see if we, now that my sound's up, let's see if we can uh, get something a little better at better. Let's see here. Um. Oh yeah. How's about this? Just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. You can Google it. You've been blessed. Thank you. Sir. Let's jump into this. I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. <clears throat> okay. Now, we uh, we got tons, tons to talk about. In fact, Matt Gerard, who, um, who has emailed us and called in our comment line so many times that we actually had a picture of him in our last season uh, when, <laughs> when he would, when he would <laughs> write in, we'd bring a picture of him up uh, because he, we called him the third host. So Matt Gerard, in very Gerard fashion, has, uh, has, has called in and written in. So not just one, but two different platforms. He, he, he sent me all of his questions, then he called each one in on the, uh, just in case we wanted to use audio. Um, he sent in, are you ready for this? 15 questions. And they're all good questions, by the way. So we're going to, we're going to look at some of Matt's. So this is bypassing some of the earlier ones. Um, 
And that's okay. Maybe we'll get to some other ones too. There's, we have so much to talk about. One of the things, by the way, to our chat room, one of the things that we do not have right now is really good Mystery Bible Theater 3000 clips. So if you have a Mystery Bible Theater 3000 clip that you'd like us to talk about, please send it in. We skipped last last week because I was desperately trying to get our website into a place where people could actually log in. We're still having trouble, but not the point. Pray for us on that right? It's yeah, it's uh, it's frustrating, but you know what? Mike is the Mike is the hero of all of that. We're he's he's doing amazing work. Okay, um, let's see. Here. We're gonna start with uh, so Matt has four questions and then another eleven. So we could go anywhere here. <laughs> let's start with the first one. Just roll the just dice. Start, like, yeah, <laughs> just go down the list here. He says this. He says uh, first question: What do we make of the last few verses in Mark? Are they God's word or man's words? Also, had you lived prior to the discovery of the older manuscripts, would you answer? Would your answer be uh, this differently? Okay, so for those who don't know, there are a significant amount of manuscripts, biblical manuscripts, uh, that end at Mark sixteen not, uh, eight, um, and then there are others that go obviously the rest of the the way through sixteen. Um, if you look in your in your Bible, depending on the Bible, it'll tell you that this is probably later. That it doesn't, uh, it's not found in in um, in early manuscripts or in some early manuscripts. We should say, and the reason. So we need to be really honest about this. There, there is a great article that I found right before we came on air. This is probably why I forgot to turn the audio on. Um, it's by Texan Canon Institute Phoenix Seminary, and it's called. This one is called now I. This isn't the only one I read. I read another article that looked at a case for the longer ending of Mark. This one is called A Case Against the Longer Ending of Mark. Simple, right? Um, and he really does a fantastic job of, of showing kind of both sides of the argument and then why he believes that the longer ending should not be included. Now, uh, he gives... Internal evidence, external evidence, all sorts of things. He admits uh, up front that uh, 90% of manuscripts have the longer ending of Mark. He also admits that a lot of the early church fathers do attest to the longer uh, ending of Mark. Like they, they quote it or they reference it. However, there are early church fathers who say that it was added, that it was not original. And so... Um, he the reason I like this article so much is because he uh, has has given kind of both sides. Uh, this is just one of the things that I kind of honed in on here. He says it, for external evidence of the long uh, against the longer ending of Mark. This is what he says. He says the oldest old Latin manuscript concludes at Mark sixteen eight with a version of the shorter ending and lacks sixteen nine through twenty. The oldest Syriac ma manuscript ends at 16.8. The oldest Sahidic manuscript ends at 16.8. The earliest evidence we have for the Christian Palestinian Aramaic version of Mark ends at 16.8. The, uh, uh, the oldest Arminian manuscript ends at 16.8. The oldest Gregarian manuscript ends at 16.8. So, uh, well, and then obviously there are some older Greek manuscripts that don't have it. Another statement that he has, and then I will... Wait, can uh, we just... <clears throat> yep. Pause there and and like look at the implications of that. What yeah. we have is a, a basically an explosion of, of distribution translation, all of which pr uh, uh, follows missionary work. In other words, the reason why we have all these translations is not just because someone is sitting in some city just ripping off translations of all the languages they know. These represent the spread, the expansion of, of the gospel. Right. Yeah, the expansion of the gospel into multiple cultures and languages. And that is one of the important uh, uh, facets that text critics evaluate. When It's not just the number of manuscripts like you pointed out. It, it There's all sorts of other things that need to be put on the table, and we evaluate all of them together. So go ahead. I just wanted to share that point. Yeah, great point. Um, I thought so. So um, this is what he, this is in his, uh, kind, he has six, he's talking about a specific scholar who is arguing for the longer ending of Mark. And um, he says this, he says the contents, this is number four in his list of six, uh, six points. 
He says the contents vocabulary and awkward fit of the longer ending in relation to Mark 16, one through eight suggests that this was not the ethereal ending to Mark's gospel. <coughs> this is a very important admission from snap, the person that he's, uh, that he's responding to, which I will take further below. So I think that it needs to be noted that, uh, one of the things that I've kind of, uh, I've seen personally is that I don't think that it fits. I don't think that uh, it flows the way that Mark writes his gospel. I think that the longer ending doesn't sound like Mark's. It's not. It's not his. Uh, it doesn't sound like he's writing it. If I may, now, on that very please. Point, yes, uh, I'm referring to Porter and Pitt's Fundamentals of New Testament Textual Criticism. This is a there's a newer edition now and they're charging like twice as much for it. Sadly, of course they but are <laughs> one of, one of the, uh, for weighing internal evidence, you were contrasting external versus right. internal. The, the external evidence would touch on points. Like you said about the distribution of different translations, like, you know, and, and it kind of like, wow, all in these early translations, they're all, uh, ending at verse nine. Or verse eight. Internally, the, what you're describing is referred to as scholars as cohesion. And uh, so quickly, the textual phenomenon that describes the linguistic features and functions that enable text to hang together as text. Well, regarding the end of Mark, they say the vocabulary used there is so different from the words he uses elsewhere in the gospel. Then he, uh, Porter Pitts here gives some exam several examples to disbelieve, to harm, I won't uh, give you the, the Greek, but uh, to confirm, to follow, to see after these things, to go, to work together later. There is no, co so in terms of this category of cohesion, there is no cohesion linguistically between the lexical items in the long ending of Mark and the gospel of Mark as a whole. That's a major point uh, in, the, in the academic lingo of what Caleb's talking about of it just doesn't fit. I mean, in layman's right. terms, it don't fit. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the the question by Matt, whether or not, you know, if we lived earlier, would we? The, oh, yeah. That's a really good question, too, because yeah. that that's a, you know, if you were born, let's say, in the Syriac speaking world, you would just know the shorter ending. Right. If you right. were if you grew up in the, in one of, you know, where that Latin uh, manuscript was held up as exemplary, right? You, so the a lot of that is the function of where you're born geographically, right. right? And and the information you have access to, and this is one thing that is really wonderful from our time it, with all the difficulties and all the craziness and evil that's definitely in the world. There's always been evil in the world, but um, this internet technology that allows us to see so much information right. in a glance and to compare and contrast all these different pieces of information really sets us up in a unique position historically. Then like, like he's suggesting, you know, someone born in the, you know, in the middle ages where, you know, every Greek manuscript, you know, let's say has this long ending of Mark, you know, and unless, and you might never, it might never occur to you that there is a manuscript somewhere that is different. And uh, that's, that's the nature of the fallen world, you know? Uh, yeah, I think, that, I, 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 think what, I think what you're saying is a really important point that, you know, it's hard to say whether or not I would uh, believe in a longer ending of Mark or not, because it I it probably depends. would. I mean, if I, but, but here's the thing, if you grew up in a Mormon household, you think, you think the Book of Mormon is scripture. Right. If you grew right. up in a Muslim household, you're going to think, you know, Jews what you're Christians saying is really, crazy and you're going to think the Quran. So this what is you're why, why redemption is a regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It's not what, a solution to a man. It's not man solving a problem. I think what you're saying is really interesting though, because the, <clears throat> I completely agree with you. I think that the biggest catalyst for us to have faith is our parents, right? Those who grow up in, in Christian homes or in believing homes as, you know, with broad brushstrokes, uh, believe what their parents have, have taught them. However, even in my own you know, seeing my father's progression from being raised in a very dispensational Baptist home, and then his kind of shift in his own theology, it's almost like a coming of age story, right? He comes of age, he goes to seminary himself, and he kind of, he, he, he finds his own 
footing yeah. on the mountain, right? And and yeah. he's and he climbs the, he climbs his section uh, with his own with his own grips and That's his own. That's the ruach. That's the spirit. Right. Yeah. yeah he's following but, the spirit. Yeah. But then I would say the same thing for for me. I'm not saying that my father was you know was wrong on a bunch of things or anything like that. I'm just saying that you know in in my own journey, in my own coming of of age, in my own studies, I've kind of found my own my own path as well. And I think we all kind of do that. And people might say to me or might say to anyone, well, you still believe almost exactly the same as your parents. And I would say, yeah, that's that, you know, I think once again, our parents tend to be uh, a huge catalyst <clears throat> for what we believe, but also the the surrounding areas and, and whatnot. But ultimately, uh, I think that what I'm trying to, to pinpoint is the fact that as we grow as believers, what we're called to do is to study on our own and to understand and to come into our own beliefs so that we hold it ourselves so that it's not just, you know, founded on what our parents have said. Well, yeah. What does it mean to be a defender of the faith? You can't be a defender of the faith unless you own, own your, your moves, you know, and right. you own the, you own the tradition and, and we have to come to our own ownership. I, I think a good, uh, jujitsu, uh, analogy is fitting here, Caleb. Heck yeah. Like if your dad was really great at jujitsu and, and you know, does that mean you're great automatically? I, I already got watching? the, I, I already got the perfect analogy for this. We, the, in, in our school, we got uh, two black belts. One is a 140 pound Hawaiian guy. The other is a 130 pound, uh, uh, Filipino guy. And they're both just as dangerous. They both can kill just about anyone that they want to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but even at, even at their weight, you know, the 130 pound black belt is taking on these 220 pounds, you know, blue belts and just absolutely crushing. And, the, and, but the point is, is that both of them have completely different styles, right? So, so their journey has taken them in two completely different ways. If you roll with one, you're going to get a completely different, uh, role than you are with the other guy. But the students now all benefit right from that, That's right? Because the, the best students are going to absorb and then rebuild and kind of have their own hybrid. My, my professor said to me just last week, he said, if I could have gone back and done anything, I wish my professor would have told me, no matter what position you're in, take the back. Always try to take the back. And so that's what I'm going to try to teach you. So you, we're finding our own style and our own voice within the movements that we're doing, which is, which is really odd to think of because really all you're doing is trying to smash somebody's face. <laughs> and the reason, I'm, I'm why, joking, do, why do we have to come to, to our own ownership? <clears throat> Pardon me. I, I, some... I think we have to come to our own ownership because we have to truly believe and have faith in what we, what we see in the word, right? Absolutely. And your historical circumstance is new and different. <clears throat> you're having to respond to a slightly different world than let's say your dad right. did when he was working on his education. Different world, environment, right? The, to quote, uh, is it the Hobbit? The world has changed. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> no, but the right. Each one of us, even today, each one of us are in a unique historical, you know, social network situation. And we're uniquely called to bring the light of truth into those situations. And, and that's for everybody who's a believer. It doesn't matter if you're a PhD student or you haven't done any education at all. If you, if you love Yeshua, that's what you're called to do. And, and that means we have to do some hard work of prioritizing. How do I, you know, discerning the things of the kingdom and putting them first in my life rather than, Oh, you know, I'm going to make a million dollars and, and then, you know, move to an Island somewhere. And that that's their priority. You know, it's, it, it, and we all have to learn to, uh, to hear, you know, do we hear his voice and are we being obedient? And it'll, there'll be some times where we differentiate a little bit one from another, but it doesn't have to be hostile. If, if we're being led by the same spirit, there won't, it, hostility would only be of the flesh. <clears throat> Okay, but so if there, but in a situation where there's like someone who's lying and 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 being a false teacher, that kind of hostility is different. That's that's there needs to be a strong defense of the word of God. So, but, but let, back to the mark. If someone came to me and said, you know, I grew up with the King James and it has the end of Mark, and I just really love it. It means a lot to me. I, I'm not going to berate the person. 
So, I mean, don't we do the same thing with the, with the adulterous woman? I mean, the adulterous woman. What is, uh, what is, uh, Dr. Wallace say about that? It's his favorite. It's his favorite story. That's not in the Bible. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, I mean, I, even recently I went to a church that they were preaching on the adulterous woman. And for those who don't know, we've talked about this, I think two or three times on this show, but the adulterous woman story is not found in, in, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar it's, to the, it kind of sim- falls yeah. in some similar ways to the end of Mark. Except for that. It's pretty obvious that people tried to, they wanted it in there. It's not in the yeah, same they place. Moved it into, they yeah, move exactly. it all over the place. In fact, Wallace, when I interviewed Wallace, he says, there's one manuscript where the person was obviously so upset that the adulterous woman wasn't in the text that he cut the, the, te- the, uh, the, the material and sewed in the story of the adulterous woman. But here's the thing is that when, you know, when we talk that's about a, stuff that's like, a great, that's a great story. <laughs> the, the thing is that when we talk about this, when we talk about the adulterous woman, most likely not being of the original author, uh, people get very upset because it's a story that they very much love and they, and they very much, uh, relate to, and, and it's been preached on so many, so many times that, uh, it, it's held close to the heart. Now, this actually brings up the, uh, the question, another question about, about penmanship penmanship when i say that i mean like who are the authors of the of the apostolic scriptures if something has been in the bible for long enough does it become scripture and my response to that <clears throat> there are some people who are going to say well the long, longer Adverse any, possession yeah the, the, that's yeah, the exactly. law that, like like you <laughs> like yeah. you have a, it's a, an a, easement a, that's that's become my property now right yeah, it's mine it's been i've i've mowed that lawn for 20 years. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't, I don't care if you come and read, you know, what do they call it? Where they come and they, no, the board, no, sorry, adverse possession. It's mine. I've. Yeah. But, know. but here's, here's the thing is that, is I think that, it's 10 years in Washington state. It is. You're right. If you, if you, if you care for a little piece of land and it's, you, you assume it's yours, nobody's do it. Nobody, everybody yeah, assumes nobody it's yours. If they yeah. come and do a, a, a fresh, what do they call it? You know, assessment of the property line and they change it. It's like, look, keep, doesn't matter. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter, but can I you say the same thing my, about script? It doesn't matter. John seven is in the Bible. You I know, got that on my property. Mark. I'm oh, not you? joking. My, my neighbor moved his fence back a foot and a half. And I asked him, I said, did you move your fence back or did they move their fence forward? He said, I moved my fence back. I said, when did you do that? He's about seven years ago. I'm just waiting. Got three more years. <laughs> no, I'm not. It's not. I mean, but the, but the point here is is this: what makes scripture scripture? And in my mind, it's not how long some something has snuck into the Bible and stayed there. In fact, I don't even think you know. We we t- we've talked about uh, before. We've talked about like translations of the Bible. Is the English translation of the Bible script like truly of God? And my answer is the original authorship, the original manuscripts were of God. The copies yeah. are not, you know, there's, there's going to be mistakes in the copies, but, but the original authorship was correct. Yeah. And, and think about, you know, how many NASBs are, have they been? How many NIVs that, you know, they keep sharpening it. Why? Cause it, cause the world changes for the same reason we, you know, the world changes and, and there's drift in what words mean. Just like, you know, the famous passage from James, you know, if someone comes into your assembly wearing gay apparel, <laughs> right now it's like they're not going to translate it that way anymore because of drift of the way words shift over time and they're going to say okay let's take another stab at this you know well it's just like wallace you know wallace when he for in the second edition of the uh, of the net bible he accidentally put an extra s on the word as and that that edition of the net bible which i think was Came 96 <laughs> become the ass bible and so, I mean, that's, it's referred to as such the ass Bible, because he accidentally put an extra, he typed an S twice and nobody caught it. And so we refine, you know, or I mean the adultery Bible, which, which, uh, I think there's how many are left in the world today, six or something. I, I'm off on that, but it's, it's very few. It might only be four or something like that, where they accidentally said in the 10 commandments, they of left Exodus, the not off. Yeah. So you shall commit adultery. Right. And they caught it quickly. That's why there's so few of them left, but still those, the, and they're, they're essentially priceless manuscripts. Why? Because people want those mistaken Bibles, but, but ultimately they want them because it's a phenomenon, Right. It's like um, coins, you know, with the wrong, with a little error on the coin, you know, super rare. 
Johnny A asks, hello, do chat questions get answered live? It depends. We try to stay on topic. Um, if you want to have a question answered, you can send them to chegatorresource.com, C-H-E-G-G at torresource.com, or leave us a message, 253-465-3205. Uh, but no matter what, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Because let's do it. we want to hear from you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, so back to our questions here. So uh, Matt says, along the same vein, why do we get so upset over the idea that the Gospels could have been originally written in Hebrew? I want to I want to stop there, but I'm going to keep going. It seems like an odd hill to be willing to die on when the current oldest manuscript is at least a hundred years after it was originally written. Okay, uh, number one, my argument is not uh, so. I am against Hebrew primacy for numerous reasons, which I will outline here shortly. And I think that they're important. I think that it is a very important argument. And, and this goes back to inerrancy. It goes back to the inerrancy of scripture, ultimately. So the question that, that might be, uh, the parallel question might be, why is inerrancy so important? That would be, that would be my, my follow-up to that. But when we talk about Hebrew primacy, what really bothers me oftentimes is that the scholarship that goes into it is not being fully honest. In other words, there's there's larger problems than just someone saying, I think that the Gospels were written in Hebrew. Um, people are not being fully honest with the evidence that is put forward. So, so really, I think that um, it is, it's twofold. Is it a matter of, uh, of Hebrew primacy? Yes, I'm against Hebrew, Hebrew primacy, and I'll tell you some of those reasons in just a second. But ultimately, I think it's a problem of, uh, of flawed scholarship in general, flawed research and flawed scholarship. And I think that, and I think that the people who, not all the time, I'm not going to, this isn't a broad brush, I don't want to make such broad brush strokes that I just throw everybody out. But I think that a, a majority of the time, uh, the, the, uh, the arguments that lead people to believe in Hebrew primacy uh, come from very sloppy and very lazy scholarship. Now, I'm not the greatest scholar in the world. In fact, I would say that I'm still very much Are learning sure? from... Are you sure? From, I'm learning from, from scholars. I wouldn't even consider myself mm. a scholar. But I can, I can smell it. I can smell, you know, I can smell something rotten when, when I smell something rotten, right? And ultimately, I think that the Hebrew primacy camp, for the, mo for the most part, not all the time, but for the most part, is coming from a very interesting place. Now, that is not to say that there aren't people who are trying to understand the place of Hebrew and Aramaic within the first century. And I think that that is a very worthy cause. I, I think that, and, and I myself have, have done studies on that. How prevalent was Hebrew and, and, and Aramaic and Greek in the first century? And uh, how should that affect our understanding of the text? Now, with all of that said, let's go to Hebrew primacy. Why is this such an important point? And the reason why is because if the original language of the scriptures was written in Greek, then that was the inspired text of that the Holy Spirit gave. It, and so when we see people like Andrew Gabriel Roth or others who are trying to say that it was originally written in Aramaic, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, see, this, pro this text right here, and this happens, there's several passages that Rob talks about in his critique of Andrew Gabriel Roth's Aramaic New Testament. But there's passages where he'll say, well, this is a really difficult text in Greek. But if we translate it to, to Aramaic, now all of a sudden I can I can get out of these difficult situations because I can make it I can smooth this text out however I want. I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. There is tension in the text, and we have to understand what that tension is, and we have to understand why it's written the way it's written. We can't just say, oh, it's a translation, so I'll just translate it however I want back into the original languages. Ultimately, this gets back to, to errancy, whether or not we believe that the scriptures are God-breathed or not. And if we say that they're a translation, I mean, have you ever tried to... We used to, we used to sponsor Japanese students, and the Japanese students would come, and one of our favorite things to do was to have them try to tell us jokes from Japanese translated into English. They never made any sense. And, and we would just sit there and laugh and laugh and laugh, not because the joke was funny, because we didn't get the joke. It made absolutely no sense at all, but they would just think it was the funniest thing ever. And then we would laugh because it made no sense. And so it's, you know, Hebrew and Aramaic are such different languages from English. 
And Greek is so different from Aramaic and Hebrew that when that trying to say, well, it was actually written in Hebrew, there's a lot that has to go into how we would translate. And it really puts doubt on the text. We don't have a translation. The Greek manuscripts are not translations. They are the original text. That's why it's so important. Rob? Yeah, yeah. And and there's there's things, uh, little, little things, like, for example, if if it was Hebrew, why do they use the word Pascha every time, which is an Aramaic term? And there's a there's a bunch or mana mana. There's a bunch of Aramaic terms. Uh, it doesn't make sense that the Greek would have an Aramaic word translator into Greek if the original source text was Hebrew. It would be Hebrew. And then on the flip side, there's words that are Hebrew, like Paul uses arabon, arabon, which is the uh, the surety of the gift of the Holy Spirit, and arabon. It's a Hebrew word <clears throat> transliterated into into Greek. But if you're an Aramaic primacist, you'd look at the Aramaic and you go, well, they don't even understand it. They, they use a completely different word altogether. So at, at either front, those theories are what I call Indiana Jonesing. They're, they're trying to create a search for the lost ark and to get people excited about it. Kind of like the copper scroll thing, right. send me money. And I'm going to provide this, I'm going to get you, you know, the original, like you're going to be able to tell your pastor off, you know, you're going to be able to put your pastor in his place because he doesn't know this information. I'm going to give you behind the scenes, never before stuff, you know, and often the people who are peddling that sadly, well, by God's, God allows it, uh, aren't even believers and they're profiting yeah. off of, uh, of this kind of thing. And uh, they're profiting off of the the naive and maybe gullibility of, uh, of believers. And we're not to buy into sensationalism. You know, it's, it, it, it's a, uh, it's a difficult thing. Another bit the, though is also, we have to remember that in the second temple period language, the, the complex language situation. So multiplicity of language was was a hot issue of the day. I mean, at Qumran, we have texts in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, I think even a little bit of Latin. So we know that, you know, the words above the cross in three languages, right? Uh, throughout the gospels, it'll say, it'll give us a, a, a phrase and then it'll tell us what it means. But the, the context is all the, the world was like this. And, and there was an idea of elite, inaccessible, holy language, even in Egypt, and uh, the, in Babylon, with the reading of, uh, you know, they were still, there were still P Babylonian priests who used uh, cuneiform. It was fading, but the idea is it's privileged, elite right. information for those who, like, are the mediators between the gods and men. And what the gospel does, it, it communicates in the basic, what they call koine, which is the language of trade, the language of commerce the language that would spread quickly. And it did. It spread really quickly. And then that was accessible to be translated from Greek then into all these other languages that where people knew Greek and then they knew this other language. And that's all in God's wisdom. It's really wonderful. We don't see any, there's no branch in the Jewish world after the destruction of the temple where there is such a mass translation of the Old Testament. We don't see it. Instead, we see an insulation occur. We see, we see an intensity of protecting Hebrew, and we're going to try to make everything Hebrew now. Now, granted, the, the language of the Gemara is Aramaic, but, they're, they're, but what are they talking about in Aramaic? They're trying to understand Hebrew. because I, So we got to take all this in, into mind. It's a complex linguistic situation. And the, the claims that the Gospels or the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew is like someone excited about uh, trying to get people excited to go and be on a hill that, that just it doesn't matter. And, can, and can, so, I, can I give an analogy? Can yeah, I yeah, give yeah. an analogy here? Jiu-jitsu? Is it jiu-jitsu? No, it's <laughs> not. It's not. Yeah, so I, I've 
been watching a series with my wife recently, and in it there is a uh, there is an artist who is a uh, a Native American, and uh, she is very passionate about her Native American heritage, and she uh, she she even speaks some of her tribe's original language in in wow. this in this series, and um, she really wants to spread the culture of her tribe and the history of her tribe. And although she uses some of her, you know, her native language from time to time, if she was going to write a book on this or in the series itself, if she were to only speak her language, the native language, no one would buy it. No one would get it. Right. It wouldn't spread. There, there would be no message that she has. Uh, no one would, no one would care. Why? Because no one would understand her. And that's how I see Hebrew in the first century. Was it, was it used? Absolutely it was used. Did Yeshua speak Hebrew? I think he did speak Hebrew. Uh, is that all he spoke? Absolutely not. And if the, if the gospel writers wanted to influence people outside of a very, very, very small uh, group of people in, in Judea, then they needed to write in the lingua franca of the day. And that was Greek. It was Greek. It was not Hebrew. And if they would have written in Hebrew, guess what? I mean, certainly the Holy Spirit can do anything that that the Holy Spirit wants to do. But the point is, is that if the if the um, gospel writers and the the New Testament writers wanted to uh, influence as many people as possible, it would not have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. That's so. I, I see it as the same. You know, you're, the the Puyallup tribe is not going to uh, get their history well known to uh, you know to everyone in the United States by writing in in their native language. They have to write in English because that's what people speak. I, I I mean, there's a lot of other reasons, but let's uh, I piggybacking, and this actually goes to your your explanation as well. Uh, Matt goes on and he asks this question. He says, Yeshua spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. And since the gospels were written in Greek, when I read my English Bible, I am reading a translation of a translation. In other words, the words written of the gospels are a translation of Yeshua's Hebrew or Aramaic words is what I believe he's saying. And when Rob reads the, his Greek Bible, he is still not reading the actual words Yeshua spoke. Let's stop right there. Um, I think that this this is one of the things that we've talked about so many times on this show, and I, I think that people still haven't quite understood our point of view on this. And, and that is our problem, not anyone else's. That's our fault for not uh, explaining well. Did Yeshua speak Aramaic and Hebrew? I believe the answer is absolutely. I, I think it's obvious that uh, he definitely spoke both Aramaic and Hebrew. Um, but did he speak Greek? My contention is that not only did he speak Greek, but that this was the main language that he used the most. And we have a lot of evidence for this. So for instance, when Nicodemus and Rob has written a wonderful article, which you can find on TorahResource.com, it is a wonderful article. It, it actually, the, your article actually really made me rethink about a, a lot about what I had originally thought about Christ's language. And the reason why is because Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, comes to Yeshua at night. And what language are they speaking? It's not Hebrew. It's not Aramaic. It's Greek. And we know this because of the mistake that Nicodemus makes, right? Am I supposed to enter my, my mother's womb again a second time? Well, he's mixing up a Greek word. Right. They're speaking Greek. And so why would That's he be exactly speaking? Right. It doesn't work in Hebrew. It doesn't work in Aramaic. So why would he be speaking Greek with the teacher of Israel? Wouldn't he opt to, to speak Hebrew or Aramaic because the teacher of Israel should know those languages? The fact here, of the matter is, here's, here's another side. If God wanted us to have a transcript of every one of Yeshua's parables in the exact language that he spoke them, we'd have it. Right. The point yeah. is God wants us to have the accounts of these key disciples. That's but let's pretend for a second. Let's let's just pretend with with Matt that uh, Yeshua predominantly spoke Hebrew and Aramaic most of the time, and that most of his conversations were in Hebrew or, and or Aramaic. The point is, is that the Holy Spirit inspired words 
to be written down. It doesn't matter if Yeshua spoke a different language. It doesn't matter if he spoke Chinese. The Holy Spirit inspired a language to be scripture, and that language in the New Testament is Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's not Aramaic. So the inspired words are, are Greek. That's the point. But I contend, nonetheless, I contend that Yeshua's predominant language spoken in everyday conversation with his disciples and others was Greek. It was not Hebrew or Aramaic. Now, did they speak Hebrew? I think there was a knowledge of Hebrew. It, uh, and I I liken this to many of the Jews within, uh, within uh, New York. Do they speak Hebrew? There is some Hebrew that is spoken, of course. But what's the predominant language that is often spoken even in the Jewish communities? Well, it's either Yiddish or it's English. It's not, Hebrew is not what, you know, they're not, can they speak in Hebrew? Of course. Are they speaking in Hebrew? A lot of the time they're speaking in, in Yiddish or they're speaking in, in English. And so, I mean, I think that the point here for me is that you, did Yeshua speak Aramaic and Hebrew? Of course. He quoted Psalm 22 in Aramaic. Right. From the cross. That's, that's important. Why not Hebrew? Absolutely. Why in Aramaic? Yes. I think right. there's a, a, a lot to be said about that, which we don't need to get into. But the point is, Yeshua cited what was appropriate for his teaching in, at the moment. Right. And he could have done that in Hebrew. He could have done that in Greek. He could have done that in Aramaic. But yeah. we, we, have, we have the scriptures that we have by the providence of God. Yeah, by the and Holy that's Spirit. That's what we're supposed to attend, attend to. If 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 someone is against that idea, then I I don't know what to say. I mean, I don't have anything. Then you know, in my view, you have there's other bigger fish to fry for you. If you know, um, but yeah, but it. So back to the idea of why do people get upset? Uh, if someone just says, you know, I want to, you know, I'm interested. I want to translate, and this has been done. I'm gonna tr I'm gonna translate. Let's say math, the Gospel of Matthew, from the Greek text, the best Greek text that we have into what I think would be like a good biblical Hebrew form. I'd say, go for it. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's no problem there. Um, so that's not, that's not upsetting at all. What's upsetting is someone pushing a book out there or some sort of uh, teaching that is, that is not truthful and selling it as if, somehow uh, believers have been uh, denied true information until now. And now they're going to explain it to us because it was originally Hebrew or Aramaic okay, or so, something. So that is a perfect segue to Matt's uh, last question in this segment. And that is this. He says, it seems like more anger is exerted over this than to uh, sarcasm alert, Christian pastors that haven't been convicted by the Holy Spirit over what is what sin is, which leads me to this question. Does the Holy Spirit <clears throat> only convict people of sin that their denomination believes, or does the Spirit convict of all sin? And if the Spirit isn't convicting of all sin, does that person not have the Spirit inside? Yeah, okay, I, I want to well, answer I think this. Back to your dad's story or my story, we and probably all the people listening, I imagine, you know, were, unless you were raised in a a Sabbath keeping home, you, you came up against, you know, you grew for a while in that pot. You're a plant, right? You're in this pot. And pretty soon your roots are like, uh, you know, I'm not getting, there's, I need nourishment that's not here. And, you know, hopefully you were able to expand and, and get that nourishment without any kind of bridge burning <laughs> of anything. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I don't think people are convicted only by what they were raised with. I think that the spirit is convicts of, of sin independent. The spirit doesn't, is not limited to the confines of denominationalism, right? A, a, a fifth generation Utah Mormon can be born again. Now they're going to have, they're going to have to now go and reframe a lot of stuff they imbibed growing up. But they can, they're nevertheless can be totally born again. There, there's examples of that. There's people who grow up totally ultra, ultra Orthodox Jewish that uh, become born again. And they then too have to go back and re, you know, work through some of the stuff that they were indoctrinated in, in, in light of the truth. So, but that's a work of the spirit. Now, faith comes by hearing so that there is 
you know, we, we all have to, you know, the church has leaders and teachers and preachers and evangelists who are called, right? Their, their duty is to proclaim the truth again and again and again of scripture, trusting that his word will not return into him void. So um, here's the thing for me. I might take a little bit different view than Rob on this, and that's okay. Do I think that the Spirit always convicts of sin? No, I do not. And I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you exa- an example. There is a there is a entire passage in the Torah that talks about unintentional sin, which tells us that a person can sin unintentionally and not mm-hmm. realize it. So I think that God works on us. I think that that I mean, you know, I think it was at Luther. Luther might have been the first one who said, I, you know, 30% of what I, I teach or 30% of what I tell you is, is wrong. I just don't know what 30% it is. I think that there's an element to that, no matter who we are in, in, in what we believe. And so is there something in my life that is probably wrong? Yes. And, and I strive as a believer because of the Holy Spirit, I strive to, to work that out. And I think that uh, we all do. I think that as believers, when we're in dwelled with the Holy Spirit, one of our longings is to root out sin and to root out things that are not in line with God. Now, with that said, why would we be, he says, it seems like more anger is exerted over uh, this than uh, Christian pastors that haven't been convicted of the Holy Spirit of their sin. I think that we're all striving to understand where we're where we are sinning. And so I see Christian pastors in that same light. They haven't come to the understanding that that certain things that they've done just like I haven't come to the understanding that certain things that I'm doing are sinful. With that said, when I look at people who are uh, pushing and teaching Hebrew primacy, it would be different if I went to a congregation and somebody said, "Well, I think that the scriptures were originally written in Hebrew." Like I'm I might give a lot more grace to that person in terms of, oh, okay, well, you know, why don't we talk about that? As opposed to someone who is openly writing and, and uh, doing work. And there are scholars, you know, was it, who is it? Randall Booth? Is he the one who uh, wrote that book? No, not Randall Booth. Who was it? What was that book that was sent to us on, uh, on whether or not? The, the languages? Yeah. Oh, it was an edit. I think Booth was one of the editors. Uh, yeah, it, one of the editors. So each chapter is by a different scholar. Just to- but a lot of problems, right? I mean, it, I'm talking about the one that uh, that uh, suggested that Christ spoke Hebrew as his main language. Anyway, uh, even good scholars are putting things out, and there's just a lot of problems with it. And I, and once again, this goes back to laziness. I think that there is a laziness of scholarship, um, and we've even seen good scholars. Uh, basically question the the legitimacy of scripture whether or not it's you know whether or not uh, the scripture is inerrant or not why because they have to do that to try to fit uh, their belief their own belief into the scriptures and and to me that is an egregious problem for teachers um and so yeah, that's yeah I, that's oh, uh, yeah it's where you have teachers who are like believers but then they're like yeah, well, we can't include John's Aramaic words because he didn't know what he was doing. Right. Uh, or um, what are some other ones? Well, we know Moses didn't really write the Torah. We know the Torah was written in Babylonian exile. And so, you know, th- that kind of stuff that has creeped in, even into sometimes into the ETS, or you get the the John Walton, you know, there really was no historical Adam. Right. Like, that's in the, that's a major professor of old Testament in the institutional education of the church today in America. And he teaches that there was no historical Adam, which means. So when Yeshua says all the righteous blood from Abel on down, or when, you know, that kind of thing, or when, when Paul talks about Adam, are we supposed to think that Yeshua and Paul didn't really know what they were talking about? Like, so then you say, okay, so Yeshua and Paul didn't really know, right? They just believed the myth. The Torah was really written in exile. Uh, Daniel was really written after the fact to make it look like prophecy. So Daniel was really written in the Hellenistic era, not in Persia. And uh, the Gospel of John's use of Aramaic is really inapplicable to our study. It's like, you have to all of a sudden ask, like, what are we doing? Like, who are we serving at this point? Who are we serving? And that terrifies me because it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, 
what idea, what bad ideas, like you were saying, what bad ideas do I have that are, you know, and that's why I'm a strong believer in that verse where it says, you know, every thought captive to Christ, right. like every thought. So, uh, and so anyway, this is, this is off topic, but it's, it might fit a little bit, but I think it's a, a good one to, to end our, end our time on. Unashamed of Jesus asks, do you guys think the apostles were educated? Somebody argued with me about this. I believe they probably were all well educated due to the fact that they uh, could speak Greek and Aramaic. I've, I, we've talked about this, but think about spending, you know, I go to school, I go to seminary and uh, I, I spend maybe a couple hours a week with my prof at best, a couple hours, probably more like one or two hours a week. The apostles lived with Yeshua. They lived with their teacher 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years. If you take hourly how much that is, uh, they not only had an undergrad, they probably had a doctorate as well. The amount of time that they put into their study with Christ and their life experience with the Messiah was particularly you, post resurrection, but Peter's such a it's a good point, Caleb. But we, we still see, and well, scriptures are so wonderful to teach us this. But you think about how Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's like, I will die for you, right? And you're still learning, like, right? Yeshua's like, Look, man, <laughs> you're gonna deny me. I mean, Yeshua's like just saying, look, I, I'm telling you the truth, man. Like, I, I love you. You're good. I've prayed for you. When you come back around, you're going to build up your brothers, you know. But as far as Peter's, Peter's is like, man, no, uh-uh. Or like, it won't, how could it be? You're not going to die on the cross. You know, I won't let that happen, you know. And then even after, why did Peter need this kick in the rear with this vision in Acts 10? Because he's still... Like he, like he, when he finally goes to Cornelius, he's like, look, God showed me not to call any man common or unclean. Like, like I can't prejudge people because they're not Jewish, you know, like he's still learning, you know, <laughs> Peter is still, it, even though he was just preaching at Shavuot right. about all the nations. Right. So it shows that I'm like, wow, if Peter can give, be given that much slack and if I can be given as much slack as the Lord has given me, then I can at least try to show some slack to, to other people. But I, I admittedly back to the earlier comment of getting upset. We know the things that, you know, the things that make me, you know, the half goes off. It's usually, it's what I consider the snake oil salesmen who are, or worse poisoning, you know? Right. And there's a, there's a, there's a vigilance that I feel I'm obligated to. And sometimes I haven't maybe been the most emotionally, uh, uh, stable in those environments. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, personal conversation is always, you know, always uh, different as well. When we come onto this show, we're able to talk to each other about the, the, this is one of the reasons that we don't bring, bring people onto this show is because we try to talk to each other we about did that. Yeah. Well, we, we yeah. did that and it didn't work. Um, but, but the, the point is, is that we try to talk to each other about the things that uh, that we see happening in the in the faith. Now, when I go and I talk to people that I openly disagree with, there is still an honor and a respect that's there, even if I think that they are dead wrong. I've sat down with Nehemia Gordon three times now and had you know had drinks with him, had meals with him, you know, and we're very cordial to each other. Do I think he's wrong? Absolutely. And now. I would even go as far as to say he's fleecing the the flock. He's what he's doing is he's trying to make a buck, and he knows it. Well, well, and, he did. I I don't know if he still is pushing the sacred name thing. I don't. know. Maybe he is. He but I guess and, I, I my point is is that we can talk about things on this show, and even though there's a listening audience, right? There's an audience that's there with us. There's a chat room that's there with us. the The point is is that is that. Uh, you know, we might come across from time to time as as emboldened against people or or things, but really it's against ideas. And I don't have any. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't have any real enemies uh, outside of the people who are enemies of Christ. That's it. Um, you know, if if a person's a believer, yeah, it's just, uh, it it it. Scriptures tells us, in as much as you're able, be at peace. You know, right? Be at peace with uh, all men. 
All right. Well, sorry for the uh, snafu at the beginning with no uh, no sound. I will it's, edit it's that actually, out. It's actually, we're going to leave that a mystery. It's it's secret. I think Jessica's idea of, of overdubbing is hilarious. <laughs> I don't think we'll do it, but I think it's hilarious. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want to, uh-oh, what's going on with my... Uh, Anyway, all right, uh, if you want to, then uh, give us a call, 253-465-3205, 253-465-3205. Please consider sending us some Mystery Bible Theater clips. You can also send them to chegatorresource.com, chegatorresource.com. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and or any podcast platform that you uh, listen to us on. It helps us. I know that sounds weird, but it does. And, of course, we hope that this conversation has done at least one thing, that is to glorify our great God. God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Why? Well, you know why. Because Messiah matters. <laughs> <laughs>